Good afternoon or early evening. I'm Sola Card Noad, uh, Silly Card Vincent P. Adams, and I'm co-founder of Vets I Am, along with my lovely wife Navia uh, Leslie Adams. And I want to welcome you here to our late afternoon or early evening uh, sh Saturday Shabbat service. This is uh, section is entitled uh, Energy of the Hebrew Letters. Energy of the Hebrew Letters. In Kabbalah, the basis for every single teaching and every single practice is the Hebrew letters, the power of the Hebrew letters. And if you're not familiar with that, if this is your first exposure to uh, Biblical Hebrew and, and the Hebrew Olive Bay, I want to give you uh, some foundation, first of all, as to why I make that statement. You know, a lot of people say a lot of things, uh, but it could just be their opinion or conjecture or extremely subjective or what have you. But I always like to uh, establish all of my opinions in some sort of basics, basis of fact, either from the Bible, either from the Zohar or the Sefer Yitzhak or, or some ancient text. Everything that I say, uh, virtually none of it is, is, is merely my opinion. And it's all based in, uh, on the ancient text. And I always quote them and, and, uh, so that you can uh, check me out and look them up for yourself. Um, I'd like you, um, and well you won't be able to see it, but I'm going to um, open up my program here. Oh, oh, you got me online here, I see. I am. I, I'm closing several times. It's, it's not closing. You're not getting the bad Okay. I tried to reduce it, so I wanted to just, I, you know, I would kind of like to bring it back up, so I didn't want to close it all the way, but every time I, I do it, it's, so I guess I'm just going to have to close it. Okay. And pull this one up. We're going to go and, and take a look at the book of Revelation, which is the last uh, book of the Bible, of the uh, Christian Bible. And then, you know, there, you know, when you say the Bible in Christianity, a lot of people don't, don't know this or don't think about it, but there are several different Bibles in Christianity. Uh, the Catholics have their own canon. Uh, the Protestant movements, such as you know Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, they have their own canon. The Eastern Orthodox Church has its own canon. The Orthodox Church of Ethiopia has its own canon, and the, you know canon means number of books or rule. Uh, the Coptic Church in Egypt has their own canon and. And there are probably a few others that I'm not even naming. So when you say the Bible, you know, what do you really mean? You know, it, it's, uh, it's relative to, you know, where you are or to who you're talking to, perhaps. So, but in all, but, but in everyone's canon, uh, the book of Revelation is the last book. And the Protestant canon is a subset of all the canons. Everyone has the Protestant canon when it, within its canon. So you can say that the Protestant canon is the smallest and is the one that is universally agreed upon by Christianity. Just a, a little, little seminary lesson there. Paid all that money for that education. Got to get some use out of it sometime. You know? Okay, if we turn to, I, I'm going to read for you. you know, have to uh, turn to this. a Bible is not necessarily required for this course. But if you turn to the book of Revelation in chapter 1, verse 8, and you read um, the standard um, King James translation, which most people are very, very familiar with, it will say in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, 
the Almighty. Now, if you go back um, and look at a, a few other verses, um, let's begin at, at verse 5 just to pick up the context. You know, who is saying that I'm Alpha and Omega? It's extremely important. So we picked up we pick up that context, I believe, if we will um, read from verse 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and, and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Okay, I, John, who also uh, am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom, and patience of Jesus Christ was in this was in the isle that is called Patmos. John was exiled by the Romans to the Isle of Patmos. Historical fact, not just biblical uh, hyperbole or whatever. For the I was in, exiled to the island of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, churches which are in Asia, uh, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and behind, and, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. Now, Son of Man is a classical term uh, for Jesus. And the reason why I read that down to that, uh, to that point was to uh, just give you the context of what was going on here. Uh, John was uh, fell into a trance in the spirit. He had basically um, astral projected. You know, I know Christians don't like that word. He astral projected into the heavenly realms, had an out of body experience, or as we Christians like to say, because we don't like those words, we just like to say he was in the spirit. Okay? And when he was in the spirit, he really says, I don't even, I don't quite know if I was in the spirit or if I was just actually, you know, caught up. But he said he heard this voice. And the voice, you know, had the voice of a trumpet saying, I'm Alpha and Omega. Now, I read that to you in the King James Version in order to illustrate and show you how much we lose in the translation from the original language into English. The King James Version was translated um, from Greek, as most people know, into English. And most people uh, believe that the, uh, the Bible was originally written in Greek, and that's totally false and in error. It was actually written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Aramaic, which is a dialect of Hebrew. Matter of fact, you know, Jesus himself, and I'm using the word Jesus to be, you know, so I will be understood by the uninitiated. Jesus himself spoke Aramaic. That was the common language spoken uh, in um, Israel, in Jerusalem, in he all of Israel at the time that he walked the earth during the first century during the, uh, the Roman occupation. They spoke um, uh, Aramaic. Now, I want to, um, now the Eastern Church, remember I, I talked about the different canons and I mentioned the Eastern Orthodox? 
the Eastern Orthodox Church, their Bible is translated from the original Hebrew and Aramaic, unlike the Roman Catholics, or, the, or I should say the West. Mm -hmm. The Western Church tran uh, has a translation from Greek into English. The Eastern Church, the other half, the other whole half of the world, has their translation from the original Hebrew and Aramaic into English or even other languages, perhaps. And this translation from that we're used to in, in the West from Greek to English loses uh, so much. It's, it's, you know, you miss so much revelation. It's ridiculous. ridiculous. I'm going to read to you now that same account out of the Aramaic English New Testament. And this is by a, a Jewish man named uh, Andrew Gabriel Roth, uh, one of the best uh, scholars I, I've come across um, in, a, in a long time. I, I think this translation is uh, by far uh, one, of the, one of the better translations from uh, Hebrew and Aramaic into, into English. Let's take me a moment. Get there here, okay. And we just want to, we want to create the foundation so we have some basis in fact or some basis in something for everything else that, you know, that we're going to teach. So if someone questions you, uh, you know, where did you get that, that junk from? Where did you get that garbage from? You just, from the Bible, you know, the, the and it's usually going to be a Christian who's probably going to be saying that anyway. So you say from the Bible, the one that you, you know, don't read. <laughs> you know, the one you don't read every day. And you let people uh, tell you what it says. Oh my God. Uh, chapter 1, uh, turn to page 666. I never noticed that before. <laughs> Oh, Chapter 1 of Revelation begins on page 666. I know he did that on purpose. <laughs> I never noticed the page numbers before, you know. Because usually when you, you know, when you, when you reference the Bible, you just go to the book. You don't go by page numbers so much, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to talk to him about that. <laughs> okay. Okay, beginning at verse 5 there, chapter 1, it says... From Yeshua, the Mashiach. Yeshua is what um, is the name that Jesus' mother called him. So I prefer to call Jesus what his mother called him. Yeshua. Okay? It says in verse 5, and from Yeshua the Mashiach. Mashiach is Hebrew for Messiah. Okay? And from Yeshua the Mashiach, the witness, the faithful, the firstborn of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, who has loved us and released us from our sins by his blood, and has made us a kingdom of priests to Elohim, the Father, to whom be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he comes with clouds, and all eyes will see him, and also they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth. All mourn on account of him. Yes, amen. I am Aleph, also Tav, says the Master Yahweh, Elohim, who is and was and is to come. The Omnipotent. I, Yochanan, that's Hebrew for John. I, Yochanan, Yochanan, your brother and partaker with you in the affliction and suffering that are in Yeshua the Mashiach was in the island called Patmos because of the word of Elohim. Elohim is um, Hebrew for God. It's actually plural. Okay? Because of the word of Elohim and because of the testimony of Yeshua the Mashiach. I was in the spirit on the day of our master Yahweh. And I heard behind me a great voice as, a, as of a shofar which said, that which you see write in a book, 
and send to the seven assemblies to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned myself to look at the voice that talked with me. And when I heard, and when I had turned, I saw seven menorahs. You know how it doesn't say, I saw seven candles. Right. Now that's the menorah, seven, a seven branch candelabra. Now that's uh, a big significance from seeing seven little candles burning, is, is it not? Mm -hmm. He said he saw seven menorahs. See how it expands the, the meaning, you know, from say seven to 49. You know, really, you know, it's, he saw 49, you know, burning <clears throat> flames as opposed to seven. What does that number mean? What does four, what's the relevance of 49 as opposed to one? I'm not going to answer that question, but ponder it. If you're really looking for the true meaning of this scripture, you have to ponder that. And that's from the original language. Now, he said, I saw seven menorahs of gold, and in the midst of the menorahs, one like the Son of Man, clothed to the feet, and turned about in a row, reaching to his feet. Okay. Uh, with a white, with a, a, a with a girdle of gold. I'll just stop there. Now going back through that, remember in the King James it says, I heard a voice like a trumpet. But here in the, uh, uh, the translation from the original Hebrew and Aramaic, it said, I heard a voice as a shofar. Okay? And if you want to find out what a shofar is, you can look at the note down there. Um, it's actually, I'll just hold it up for you. This is a shofar. Okay? Hand me one of the ram's horn shofars too has a very distinct sound that a trumpet probably does not make. If, if you uh, look through scripture, you will see that in the Old Testament, the Israelites were commanded to blow the holy shofar before they went into battle in order to ensure themselves a victory. And this one is, uh, this is called a Yemenite shofar. It's from an African antelope. A really magnificent looking looking beast if you ever get to see one and it has, you know, these two spiraling horns coming out of his head. And they make a very distinct sound. You get different tones. And then this is a, an actual ram's horn shofar. These are actually from Israel. voice as a mighty shofar speaking with him. Now, when we look at the King James and it says trumpet, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't give you the fullness of the text because when you see shofar, now you've got to go back all the way to the Old Testament and look up the usage of a shofar. When the Jews were given the Torah at Mount Sinai, when they received the Ten Commandments and the Torah, it says that they heard the shofar blowing louder and louder. The shofar, not a trumpet, you know, not this instrument of brass or metal, you know, that, you know, Louis Armstrong plays, okay? A shofar, a, a horn from a, a living animal. And the reason why it is said that it is a shofar, when um, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, and he was getting ready to kill Isaac, and God said, stop, I just wanted to see if you would do it. There was a ram who was caught by his horns, horns in the thicket. So whenever the shofar is born, blown, it is a sign and signal of mercy. Because 
uh, Isaac was spared being sacrificed by a ram who had his horns caught in a thicket of bushes and he couldn't get untangled. And so um, Abraham, you know, caught him, slew him, and made the sacrifice. So it's a symbol of mercy. It's a symbol of power. When they marched around Jericho seven times and blew, they didn't blow trumpets. The original language, if you read it in Hebrew, they blew a shofar. So it's a symbol of mercy and it's a symbol of power. So when you translate it into, uh, into Greek and then into Hebrew, it, it loses all meaning or loses a lot of meaning. Go ahead. Jump in. Any, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't mention, but jump in, ask questions. This is interactive. Anytime, stop me, uh, ask a question or whatever. This is uh, very interesting. Uh, something I learned about a year ago was, uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, maybe bring uh, when they when Moses blew the shofar on Mount Sinai, was it Mount Sinai? It was uh, I have heard was bringing in the age of Aries, the ram, uh, the age of mercy, perhaps. I had heard that once upon a time. I wanted to see if you'd heard that. You thought about it. Actually, what what it is. It wasn't the, I, I don't, it, might, it might have been the age of Aries the ram, but actually uh, it wasn't Moses who blew it. It was God himself blowing it. He was the one, you know, his voice was like a shofar. So um, he also told them that that time is going to be the beginning of months for them. The first month of the Hebrew calendar is called Nisan which is Aries. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. You know, so I don't, I don't know if that's what you heard or if that actually ushered in the age of Aries. It, it, it could definitely have been, but it was certainly the constellation that was up there at that time was the constellation of Aries the ram. And speaking of the astrology that you mentioned earlier, and uh, I furthermore heard that uh, Christ brought in the age of Pisces. The in I have to go back and look look that look that up as astrologically. Really interesting stuff. Okay, could 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 very well be. And now we're bringing the age of Aquarius. Uh, we're in the age of. We definitely are in the age of Aquarius now. You know, everything like a 2200 year age. You know, okay. Well, then you're you're, pro you're probably right about that. And what's interesting about that issuing in the age, to show you how the Bible supports the study of astrology. Um, in order for them to be released from bondage in Egypt, what did they have to? They had to slay a, ram, a, a lamb, which it. Which